to is, is, is this concept of social relationships, sociology studies social relationships. Now, normally when we talk about relationships, we mean intimate relationships, husband and wife, boyfriend and girlfriend, that's one sort of relationship. There are really other sorts of relationships that we have with a whole range of other individuals and indeed groups. Um, let's take family members, relationships within the family. Uh, sociologists are very interested in family as, a, as, a, as an important um, feature of society. So we look at relationships within the family. What is the relationship, for example, between husbands and wives? Does this vary from time to time? and from place to place. Do different cultures have different ways of dealing with that relationship between husband and wife? Some, some cultures permit more than one wife. I believe this used to be the case in Singapore, did it not, some years ago. Um, when I leave Singapore tonight, I'm going to Dubai, and then the following day I'm going to Oman in the Middle East, where I will see a very good friend of mine, um, who is Omani, who has two wives. Um, they, are, they live in separate houses. He has children from both wives. He divides his time between uh, his two families. Um, but he has very good relationships with both of his wives. They don't do things together. And interestingly, he, uh, if he does something with one wife, then the custom and the culture dictates he has to do something of equivalent value with the other wife. So last time I saw him in Dubai with one wife, he said, you see, next week I'm going to have to come back here with the other one, which is they expect an equal amount of treatment. And uh, one time he bought a car for one of his wives, but the other wife doesn't drive. So he had to buy her jewelry of equivalent value. So I think he was trying to tell me that having two wives to an Englishman may sound like a really good idea, but actually, um, there are costs associated with it as well. And um, certainly costs in terms of time as well as resources. <coughs> so relationships between husbands and wives differ depending on where you are. They differ over time. So if you think about the relationship between uh, your grandparents compared with your relationship that you either have or will have with your husband or wife, Think of the ways in which you think they will be different. Can you think of any ways that you would expect that relationship to be different? Presumably the relationship between your grandparents was a lot more unequal. Yeah? I mean, men adopted a more dominant position. Women perhaps were expected to stay in the home more and raise children. Is that true in Singapore? But is that true today? Well, I know a lot of young women in Singapore don't get married now because uh, uh, maybe that's the reason. But certainly in, in, in Europe, in, in the UK, I mean, um, the expectation of my grandparents and great grandparents was exactly that. Uh, my grandmother never worked. She stayed at home, she looked after the children, she looked after the house. My grandfather went to work, earned the money. Um, he never washed a dish in his life, um, wouldn't know how to. Uh, he didn't cook. <coughs> but he did things like mending things in the house and changing light bulbs and all the things that men were expected to do. But our generation today are expected to behave differently. Um, when my first son was born 22 years ago, this was the era of the new man in the UK. Uh, my father wasn't there when I was born. It would have been a ridiculous suggestion that he should witness my birth. He was doing what all good father's doing, sitting in a pub, smoking a cigar, drinking beer with his friends. I was there in the room, watching this horrific event of my first son being born. It was frightening, it was terrifying, it was awful. Plus, I was actually teaching most of the nurses who were in the hospital at the time, at my university. And I really wasn't sure whether they were the right people to be delivering my son, but there we are, didn't have much joy. Um, we were expected to be there. You were expected to be there today, gentlemen, when your wives have babies. I'm sure that that will be the case here as well. Um, we had to change nappies. Oh my God, that was a horrifying uh, expectation. I can remember me now, my 
son, my son, who now has a son of his own, so I'm now a granddad, albeit a very, very youthful granddad. Um, I, I remember having to tie a big handkerchief around my face, pouring aftershave all over it, so that I could bear this nappy changing. Oh my God, I never thought I'd have to deal with anything like that. And my son now does it all the time. His little boy, who's two, all the way through his life, he's changed his nappy, he's dealt with them, being sick and all of those things. But the point is, the roles have changed. So when sociologists look at relationships, they're very interested in the differences which a common relationship might exhibit, different times, different places, and seeking to explain why things have changed and are changing in the way they have, and also to look at the consequences. We might look at uh, relationships between people who have power and people who don't. Can you think of any examples where you have a relationship with somebody more powerful than you? Does anybody drive a car here? No, that would be much. Have you ever been stopped by a policeman?
that relationship. Now, this is again something that's changed. It also illustrates that power is not simply one way. There may be a complex balance of power, where one individual exerts power for a time, the other one counters that with an element of power. And power doesn't have to be uh, all about violence. Ultimately, the power of the police derives from their legitimate monopoly over violence. The police can, can force you physically to do what they want them to do, and that will be supported by the state. That's not true in relationships, in families. Power, the basis of power can be much more subtle. It can be emotional. It can be psychological. It's not all about pointing guns at people. It can be about persuasion. I can persuade you to do something, not because uh, I've got a gun in my hand and I'm pointing it at your head, but because I use various techniques to do it. So you can ask the question, well, who has power in that situation? And how uh, much opportunity is there to resist that power? We also look at the rich and the poor. Um, we look at relationships between people who have money and people who don't have money. We call this the study of social class or social stratification. We're interested in how, for example, uh, something like being poor appears to be inherited. In the UK still, you are more likely to remain in the social class into which you are born than to change social class in the course of your lifetime. So we're interested in how not just um, relationships manifest themselves between people who are rich and people who are poor, but how these differences come about in the first place and how they are sustained and maintained over generations. So, for example, you might look at things like laws of inheritance, which are absolutely fundamental to understanding how wealth stays within the hands of a relatively small group of people. If it was like a game of snakes and ladders, where as soon as you die, all your money goes back into a central pot and gets redistributed amongst the rest of the population, we wouldn't have such vast uh, differences between rich and poor in this world. But instead, practically every society, even communist ones very often, have developed ways of keeping wealth within certain social classes. And so this perpetuates from generation to generation. So if your parents have wealth and property, you will inherit that property. The state normally takes some in inheritance tax, but basically you keep it. And so you pass that on. So it becomes concentrated in a smaller, uh, smaller group of people. So we're interested in things like that and how we uh, explain that, but also what the implications of that are. Um, but we also have relationships with much larger entities than people. Um, we have relationships with corporations. Everybody in here has got a mobile phone. I know you can't go for more than five minutes without checking Facebook. That's just how it is today. And you therefore have a relationship with Facebook as an organization, with Samsung, with Nokia. I don't think you have iPhones here in Singapore, they're not fashionable. Um, you have uh, a relationship with, is it Singtel or uh, whatever your uh, service providers are here. And these are powerful relationships with corporations. Um, your ability to communicate with your friends is entirely dependent on you doing exactly what that company wants you to do. You can't control the software on your phone. They put it there. They determine what advertisements you flash up on your phone. They determine how much you have to pay them and when. And as soon as you don't pay them, phone gets switched off. You don't have any way of contacting people anymore. So you, have, as an individual, have a relationship with people multinational corporations, but you also have a relationship with things like states, governments, most obviously the government of Singapore, but wherever you travel, you enter into a relationship with that state. And indeed, some of the actions of states remote from here, millions of miles, hundreds of thousands of miles away, are influencing the things that you do here today. Um, events
this, for example, in um, the United States, have had an impact on your lives here in Singapore. Um, the 9-11 incident, the world has changed completely since then. Many of you are probably too young to uh, really have remembered what it was like before, uh, before that. But something like air travel. Air travel used to be a pleasure. Now you get this sort of virtually, uh, have to take all your clothes off when you go through security, you've got to be checked again and again, you've got to go through your bags. All of this has got completely different since 9-11. So we have a relationship with people we've never met because their conduct has an impact on what we can and can't do here. So these are all examples of relationships that sociologists are interested in. So they're not just interpersonal, but be um, what we might call macro relationships as well. Now secondly, we study what we call social institutions. Now that's one of the things you'll see sociologists like doing is giving ordinary things big, long names. Um, we do this mainly to make ourselves seem more intelligent and important than we really are. So uh, you'll be enjoying doing that yourself, I'm sure. But uh, excuse me, it's not a... It's okay, it's just water. Um, social institutions are what we might call fixed um, and structured sets of social relationships. So, for example, we can talk about the family as a social institution. Because if you look, if you take individual families in a particular place, let's take Singapore, what you'll find is they exhibit a set of commonalities. They have a number of things in common. Broadly speaking, in Singapore, you have what we call nuclear families. That is, a new family uh, with where you live, uh, a husband and wife live together and have children together in a single family unit. Although there are some extended families where people live together with other generations of their family. In the UK, we have predominantly nuclear families, um, but the family structures in the UK are subtly different. We have more children than you do. In Singapore, it's 1.1 child per family now. And uh, we still have almost two in the UK. Um, we have a much higher rate of divorce in the UK. And so it's much more common to see what we call single parent families or reconstituted families where people have got married for the second or third time. It happens here, but it's more common in the UK. And we can explain why. But these are what we call institutions because they're common patterns within a particular society. As I say, when I get to a uh, the day after tomorrow, I will meet a number of people with more than one wife. Not everybody, because if you think about it, you can't have everybody in a country having more than one wife. Can you see why? There aren't enough wives to go around, you can never import them. Um, and in human society, we still have a sex ratio of 50 50. That's just a biological fact. If at any one time there were slightly more women than men, on the planet. So gentlemen, you might think this is discrimination, but the reason for that is women live longer than men. We can talk about why, but there are various theories of why that is. Um, so, uh, I just remember, I will find it not unusual to find particularly more wealthy people having more than one wife. A friend of mine I'm going to see um, is one of four, I think it's 43 brothers and sisters. His father had um, 43 children from over 20 wives. Now, as if you've been in Islamic societies, you've only had four wives, but of course he was very good at divorcing. Because in the Bedouin tribes of the deserts in Amman, to divorce your wife, you really have to say, I divorce you three times, and that's it. Um, so he was very good, but of course he is financially responsible for them for the rest of their lives. He had a lot of money, so it was okay. So uh, over 20 wives, over 40 children. So when my friend talks about, oh, my brother, this, my brother, that, my brother, they've done virtually everything that was between them. Now that is bizarre to us here, as you know, and indeed in the UK, but it's perfectly normal there. So this is why we call it an institution, because it's more than just the personal preferences of individuals, it is the normal pattern for that society. And we can think about other things, like the school. We will be to school. Schools, uh, don't differ that much, actually, from where, from place to place. There are subtle cultural differences, but basically, a school is a school, and similar things happen. Children go there, they usually are forced to go there against their will, um, and they are all taught by adults in classrooms. You know, there's a variation about how they behave. 
sometimes, for example, whenever I walk into a school in India, everybody stands up and calls me sir. I rather like that. I introduce it here. Um, I do, I walk into a classroom in the UK, and I'm lucky people don't throw glass bottles at me. We live in a chaotic and broken society in the UK. Um, my sister is principal of a school in Sri Lanka, and uh, again, walk in there, everybody stands up and says, good afternoon, sir. Um, now, but what goes on in the classroom, the learning process, both the fact that there are rules, there are routines, there's a start time, there's a finish time, there are classes with teachers, pretty much standard of the world. Right? So we talk about the school as a social institution, because there are certain patterns and expectations about how they will exist. And the same can be said, say, for universities. There is a, there, there is a dreadful predictability about life in a university. I talked to a group of students about this topic yesterday, and I knew I was coming in to talk to you today, but I didn't wake up this morning thinking, I wonder how these students will be behaving this morning. I didn't think, I wonder how they'll be dressed. I didn't think, I wonder what they'll be doing, where they'll be sitting. Because I could have told you, there's a uniform in here. The SIM doesn't have a uniform. No one's ever told you what to wear to come to SIM, but within a very narrow range, there could be a uniform, t-shirts, jeans, shorts, everybody wears the same thing. There's nobody wearing a, a bow tie, or there's nobody wearing a bowler hat. I could have told you that was the case yesterday before I even met you. I could have said people will be standing in rows, the city in rows. I would have said there'd be nobody in the front two rows. I should have written it like an edition on a piece of paper. And give it to somebody to read out later to prove to you the point. Nobody at least is on the front post. But if they do, I get really worried because it probably means they're a bit and they're going to start shouting to me now. Um, I know you wouldn't say very much. You're not going to be talking much amongst yourselves as the odd whisper. I knew you wouldn't be smoking. That's a bit of an odd thing to say, smoking. When I went to the LSE in 19. Okay, I'll tell you when I went to the LSE. 
difference in, in uh, what has done in Nigeria. But these, that was the institution of being of the police force in Nigeria. That's what that's what it meant. So as soon as you join, you enter that culture. You start a, uh, adhering to those patterns of behaviour. So the point about social institutions is they persist irrespective of the individuals who populate them. So the family will exist if your family had never existed. This institution, this, this lecture, would be taking place if I was um, not here, and if you were not here, someone else would be doing it. It would be an entirely, um, entirely uh, similar event going on. Now, we might give it its own flavour, we might add a little bit to it, but as an institution, it will persist irrespective of any of us individually. And so sociologists look at the institution rather than the people that are operating within it normally. And that could be true. You could think of dozens of institutions, the courts, hospitals. Hospitals are entirely predictable places. Um, you walk into a hospital anywhere, and there are certain rules that you immediately are aware of, and behaviours. What, what things don't you do in a hospital? List a few things you wouldn't do in a hospital. Have a party. Open a bottle of champagne. Um, what else? Would you take your pet dog to a hospital? Right. Yeah, a lot of things. Would you laugh and joke and have fun with your friends? No, you, would, you behave in particular ways. It doesn't matter the hospitals in Singapore, in Russia, in the UK, wherever. There are certain common facts that are features of that institution. And the sociologist tries to explain why the institutions of society have the characteristics that they do. Why are they like that? And why do the people that uh, operate within these institutions, you and I, why do we conform so beautifully, so immaculately, to the rules that those institutions have? Because no one tells us, no one teaches us, we just seem to do it. And that's why sociology, I think, is quite exciting, and quite interesting. It's trying to get behind the taken for granted assumptions of everyday life. Um, okay, we, we have another concept here which um, helps us to understand how it is that we come to operate as institutions in society expect us to. How it is that we come to conform. And this is the concept of the social role. Have you heard of that? Think of the role as being a bit like a part in a play. Has anyone ever been in a play here? Any actors? I used to be in plays all the time. You know Amos Spitzer who comes to teach economics? He's an actor as well. He's often in plays in London. Do you believe that? He and I have actually been in the same play, but not at the same time. Played the same part. It's like being an actor in a play, social roles. These are, as I just put it there, these are socially prescribed ways of behaving. So let's look at a few examples. Let's look at gender. Let's look at gender. Male, female. Typically, sociologists talk about sex as being the biological differences between men and women, and gender being the social differences between men and women. And you can see that gender roles are perhaps not fixed. Okay, let's think about gender roles. Uh, could somebody give me a couple of examples associated with the male gender role in modern society? What is it? What, what are men like? Could we ladies or gentlemen that answer this? Short hair. Good. I have my hair cut in Singapore, but I always get it. Watch your towers, top floor. It's a bit risky going in there, but they do do a good haircut. I went in with my wife once and my 14 year old son, and uh, all these sort of ladies came out of massage parlors, and my 14 year old son's eyes came out like this. So my wife said, Eyes front. So we had to walk straight ahead. I'm allowed to go in and get my hair cut. Um, short hair, yeah. Okay, men are expected to have short hair. By the way, when I was a student, we had quite long hair, and that was 1970s, 1980s. Any more one other things associated with the male gender role? What is masculinity? What are the characteristics of masculinity? Yeah, I 
tough, not enough. Uh, men are supposed to be not very emotional, uh, rather not say very much, be strong, all these things. What about women? What are the things that go with the feminine gender role? Long hair? <laughs> emotional. I say nothing. Uh, anything else? Nurturing, maybe? Maternal? Are all these things typically associated with gender roles? Have these changed at all? I suggest to you they have changed somewhat. Perhaps they're not as fixed as they once were. I gave you the example of men being expected to watch children being born and change nappies and this sort of thing, clean houses and all that. Um, but the argument is there are certain things that are expected of you as a woman and certain things expected of you as a man. Give me one example of something that if a man did it, people would say that's, a, that's not appropriate. That's what women do. Wear skirts, okay. Fair enough. This takes us back to auction talent. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's an example of um, uh, a good example of wearing the kinds of clothes you wear. Now, arguably, there's been a convergence in clothing. Actually, jeans and t shirts and jeans and shirts like this, with lots of them again, obviously very, very fashionable, um, are a little bit crossed over. But there are still very, very big differences between a typical mess. Mess.